It's time for questions to the Executive Office, and we're going to start with listed questions. Just to inform you that questions three and four have been withdrawn. Um, Glenn or Patsy McGlone. Hello, Rahean. Let the whole of you last come, call you. Um, the relationship between ministers and their assembly committee is hugely significant, and we place great importance on developing a collaborative and constructive relationship with the committee for the executive office. We met the committee in February to discuss our priorities for the department, and our senior management team have also briefed it on our legislative um, budgetary and policy intentions. In relation to future meetings with the committee, we recently wrote to the chair in response to his invitation for ministers to give evidence. I am advised that we and our junior ministers are happy to do so once a suitable date can be agreed. Pat McLone for supplementary. Good idea, thank you. Um, First Minister, it is now approaching six months since the executive was restored. Uh, could you detail the responsibilities of each junior minister, please? First Minister. As the member will, uh, will note, um, that our, both of our junior ministers have been very proactive in terms of being out on the ground visiting a lot of our very good community uh, organisations that do great good relations work and that's certainly an area which um, both ministers have um, been focused on. They've also equally been um, out in, in Brussels representing the executive office um, at an occasion as well around building our international relations and by and large I think the junior ministers do a great job in terms of uh, jointly in terms of representing us at various different um, uh, events and meetings with different groups so I suppose they have a very broad remit in terms of supporting the executive office and from time to time we carry out different responsibilities and have a different remit to focus on, particularly um, attending meetings, as I said, meeting with relevant groups um, or particular areas. So they cover everything right across the office. Paul, Paul, Paula Bradshaw. Principal Deputy Speaker, First Minister, when, when you were at committee along with the Deputy First Minister, you agreed that you would come back before the summer recess. We were expecting, in terms of our forward work pro programme, that you would be here this coming Wednesday, and no ex explanation was given as to why you weren't coming. We really wanted to see both of you at that committee because we have been so let down. Is there a question, Paula? We, well, we wanted to raise those, and I would uh, ask for an explanation as to why you're not coming to give account of the, of the poor and late communication we've been getting from your departmental officials every week. For our committee. Thank you. First Minister. Well, can I say to the member that I'm aware that our department have liaised with yourself to try and find an appropriate date, and I'm also aware that your committee perhaps is closing up earlier than other committees this, at the end of this session, so perhaps there's a difficulty in terms of finding a date. I'm also equally aware that we're meeting later on this afternoon, so hopefully we can discuss these things out. Call Nicola Brogan. Um, the First Minister will know that the Finance Minister, Keev Archibald, has been working to get a better financial deal <coughs> from the British Treasury on behalf of the Executive to ensure that we get better public services here um, in the North. Can the First Minister therefore outline when the Jude monitoring allocations will be made? First Minister. Yes, thank you to the member. Um, and I understand that our Finance Minister, Dr. Keith Archibald, is ready to make um, recommendations to the Executive on June monitoring allocations, which would see obviously much needed money um, that's available um, being allocated to departments to deal with a whole raft of pressures, including additional money for health or the money for the pay and grading review for education support workers and across the whole, all of the departments. It's in my opinion that it's normal routine business of the executive and the assembly, and I believe that we should be meeting with urgency in which to try to get clarity for departments on their budgets. Call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. My, my question is partly be answered, but I, I would like a more detailed response to what today's the junior first ministers have actually taken uh, in this mandate so far. First Minister. Yeah, as I said, I mean I think our junior ministers. Um, can be credited with the fact that they are out on the ground, they are making so many groups, they are you know, looking at the very excellent work that's being done by so many um, groups across our community, and they carry out that whole raft of functions um, from time to time, deputising for um, both myself and the Deputy First Minister, or attending in their own right, um, as I said, everything from Brussels to meeting local groups and attending meetings, and particularly around areas like anti violence against women and girls, engaging with young people. Um, very positive engagement, I think, um, both ministers have been engaged with um, throughout their tenure in office. Call Daniel McCrossan. 
Speaker, question two, please. First Minister. Gary Muggett, um, it's important that the programme for government is agreed with the executive before we confirm what will be included within it. We have speak, um, previously spoken about our priorities for this mandate, and this includes um, housing. We have also highlighted the importance of childcare, reducing hospital waiting lists, ending violence against women and girls, special educational needs, Loch Ness, and developing a globally competitive economy. First Thank you, Speaker. I asked the Minister specifically in relation to uh, housing and whether it will be a standalone outcome in the programme for government. Minister, your uh, own party committed to building 100,000 houses. Your executive, which you lead, is only committed now to building 400 this year. Is that a failure on your part as First Minister to deliver housing for all? First Can I Minister? say that um, there's no escape from the fact, and it's absolutely a priority, that housing must be built on a scale uh, and have ambition to build at a scale and speed that addresses our housing situation. So I'm absolutely wedded to what has previously been committed to, and I also am absolutely clear that um, the priority of, of identifying 400 houses is, doesn't cut it. So I want to be constructive. I want to work with the Minister. I know that our Finance Minister wants to work with the Communities Minister also to ensure that we do whatever we can to uh, raise that number. This is the figure that's been put out there in terms of the draft budget, but we have to do better, and we must do better, and I am determined that we will, because we have to give people access to good quality housing if we're going to see action to reflect the scale, as I said, that's required. Call Kerr Ferguson. Thank you to the First Minister for your answers off the start. First Minister, would you share my concerns about the ongoing Tory austerity and underinvestment in our public services? And this is what's having a seriously negative impact on delivering social and affordable homes. First Minister. Yes, I mean, I, I absolutely concur, and I think every member in this chamber should concur with that. Um, we know that the executive budget has been significantly underfunded by the British Government for well over a decade to the detriment of our public services, whether that's health, education or on the issue of housing. So it is an unacceptable fact that we have been underfunded, funded well below need, and that's a fact which I'm glad that at least there's some acknowledgement now that that is the case. But this is the direct result of Tory austerity. It's a direct result that has meant that less social housing has um, been built, that has increased our waiting list, that has led to a sharp decline in public services, and it's just not acceptable. And that's why we must stand with one voice in terms of making the case for properly funded public services here. I'm glad that our Finance Minister and the Executive are working to ensure that our finances are in a stable financial footing so that we can actually invest in our essential public services around health, education, childcare and key infrastructure projects. And in terms of housing more specifically, um, greater public investment is definitely part of the solution and there are other innovative solutions that we also need to bring forward so that we do what we can to plan for the future to increase the supply of social and affordable housing. So in terms of the question around improving public service and supporting people, we have to give people, families out there that are really like on waiting lists for um, seriously long times, we have to give them hope that we're going to build homes. Um, I'm determined to do that and I'll work collectively with all executive colleagues that that we get to a point where we have the proper housing supply strategy in place that allows us to deliver and make it happen for families that need homes. Questions three and four have been withdrawn. I call Mark Darkin. Our statement to the Assembly on the 7th of May set out matters discussed at the inaugural meeting of East West Council on the 26th of March. The meeting primarily focused on the Council's strategic direction and governance, including its terms of reference, future direction and the establishment of Intertrade UK. It did not deal with specific, if I could say the word specific issues, and therefore discussions did not include the issue of funding for Casement Park. Mark Durkin for supplementary. It's disappointing that Casement wasn't raised at that opportunity. I wonder if it was raised at an earlier meeting on the 5th of February with the Prime Minister. However, we do welcome uh, the First Minister's commitment last week that Casement will be built on her watch. And while we appreciate and welcome that confidence, is the First Minister as confident that it will be built in time to host the European Championships in 2028? First Minister. Uh, thank the member for that. Um, he shouldn't be surprised that it wasn't raised because this was an inaugural meeting of a new body that's primarily focused on um, kind of improving relations and 
conversations. So it's not to replicate any of the other structures that we have. It's not the forum in which it would be raised. But I can assure you that at every opportunity that I've had, I've raised this with every British uh, government minister, including the Prime Minister. Uh, and, and will, uh, most significantly, uh, in order to, when we get post the 4th of, Ju uh, 4th of July next week, whoever comes out the other side, whoever occupies um, Downing Street, will have uh, me knocking at their door in terms of the, the huge significance that we have, the huge economic boost that we have to have the Euros hosted here. And I want us to be part of that, and I do not want us to miss a moment there. So whoever comes in to 10 Downing Street, whoever occupies the Treasury, we want firm commitments in terms of their commitment to the financial package that will actually gets, us, uh, gets casement built and also gets us on our part as, as part of the Euros. Call Pat Sheehan. <coughs> Uh, would the First Minister agree with me that holding Euro 28 in a state-of-the-art casement park is an unprecedented economic opportunity that we just can't afford to miss? Yes, I mean, absolutely. I think um, it's a prospect that we must all be ambitious about. This is something that will lead to the betterment of our wider society, the economic boost, the, the investment in sport, the legacy that that will leave, the tourism impact that we will have from it. I mean, the benefits are immense, and it is an opportunity um, not to be missed, and an opportunity indeed that we must um, maximise. And I can say to the member, um, Casement remains a flagship project for the executive. It's a new deal, new decade, new uh, approach, commitment, and as I've said. In the past, casement will be built just in the same way as Kingspan and Windsor Park have already been delivered. I think it's important now that we get to the other side of this election and we get that immediate firm com uh, confirmation from the British government um, in terms of their stated funding commitment. And we need to get that without delay so that we can move on a pace and actually secure our place within the Euros. Call Sean Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, First Minister, for your answer so far. Um, can I ask how up to date the list of capital projects on which the Strategic Investment Board um, is currently advising the executive actually is? First Minister. It's a bit wider than the question itself, so I'm happy to write to the member just to give you more detail on that, if that's okay. I call Colm Gilder now. First Minister. At 347 acres, the Maze Long Cash site is twice the size of the Titanic Quarter, and it has great potential in itself, but also can be an economic driver, not just for Lagan Valley, but for the whole region. The site has immense potential as an economic hub, with around 1 million people living within 30 minutes of it, and it occupies a strategic location on the key transport corridor. The three existing tenants on the site deliver unique and varied activities, but illustrate what really can be achieved. Our UAS have brought a substantial area of the site back into use and estimate that their current business levels attract approximately 375,000 visitors across a schedule of 20 events. The Ulster Aviation Society collection of aircraft and memorabilia is one of the top attractions in the area with an estimated 9,200 visitors annually. And then we also have the Air Ambulance, which has been tasked uh, over 4,200 times since operation commenced in 2017, delivered significant social and economic benefits through lives saved and early interventions. It must also be a site for the community, a uh, dedicated area, uh, areas as envisaged for community and sport use. We must build on the common ground that we all share, and that is to realise the potential of the site for the benefit of all, and we are absolutely committed to working with the Development Corporation to achieve that. Call Colm Gilder now for supplementary. Thank the Minister for answer, and I particularly welcome the commitment to build on the common ground that we all share to realise the potential of the Long Cash site for the benefit of all. As such, First Minister, can you outline the next steps in moving forward with that? Yes, um, both myself and the Deputy First Minister and the Junior Ministers were all um, at the Balmoral Show. On, I think it's on, on days like that that you actually get to see the real potential of the site and you know, that it's something that is evident to us all. So I think it's fair to say that, um, just to say, the Agriculture Show excelled again um, this year. But we need to match the potential um, of the site with a similar level of ambition. And the, as I said, the, the site has such enormous potential for business, for housing, for recreation, for learning, for sport, for us all. I think 
I want to see the site developed in the same way that we have seen with the regeneration of, of other um, sites, particularly if you look at um, the Abrington site, the Crumlin Road Jail. Um, you can see all those things that um, have opened up to be really inclusive spaces um, and they're the building blocks for a shared society. So in terms of the next steps and the question that you ask, um, the Deputy First Minister and I have accepted an invitation to meet the board, um, to take stock of the current position and to hear their thoughts on the development of a roadmap for the site and that's going to inform um, how we proceed. The scale of the investment will be huge um, for sure but the cost of doing nothing is even greater. Um, we don't want to see any more delays. I think a regenerated uh, MLK site will work for everyone, and I want to work with the Deputy First Minister to see that happen. Call David Honeyford for a supplementary. Uh, speaker, uh, regrettably, the last question we're down to the wire and the timeline for Case and Power, but can the Minister give us a timeline for the Mays Long Case site? I welcome uh, what she's just said around it, but we need to get finally on with uh, seeing the potential for all of our community that we can benefit. Thank you. Yeah, I think that um, it's important that we meet with the, the board, as I've said, because I think that's our first step. They ha perhaps um, have refreshed um, thoughts in terms of the, a roadmap for development of the site, uh, and we're going to do that uh, very shortly, and they, that will allow us to, I suppose, proceed in a way which is more informed and taps into the potential that we have. Um, but crucially, it starts with this um, meeting which we're going to have with the board. I'm hoping we'll be able to do that in the coming weeks, and then we'll be able to report more and, and talk more, because, as the member knows, we've talked about this in this House um, on a number of occasions, and we're all passionate about doing it. Now it's time to turn that, um, I suppose, that ambition into action. Call Matthew Tull. Thank you. Deputy Speaker, uh, First Minister, I welcome the fact that you're meeting with the board, and obviously we now have first deputy for, uh, junior ministers for meetings, and these meetings are happening. But it's also been the case that members of the board of the Long Cash Development, Mays Long Cash Development Centre, are getting paid six thousand pounds a year, effectively, with all due respect to them, to have meetings. That's a decade of that site largely, question, not simply lying uh, on you. Question Can you give time. us a clear timeline for when we're going to get an update? Yeah, the, the, the Development Corporation itself is, is established under statute and it has a wide range of powers to enable to effectively take forward the regeneration of the site. I have already mentioned some of the areas where the site has been developed <laughs> and that there's even more potential. Uh, and, and, and uh, indeed, uh, throughout uh, since its inception, They've had current functions around retaining the site, ensuring the listed buildings are preserved. They have health and safety concerns. And also they have been, as I said, developing their plans for how they see the site expand into the future. So um, I'm going to focus on the positivity. I'm going to focus on the potential. And I'm going to work with the Development Corporation to make sure that we realise its potential. Linda Dillon. First Minister. We remain committed to introducing legislation in the Assembly for a public, uh, statutory public inquiry and address scheme as soon as possible. It's important victims and survivors are absolutely at the centre of this, which is why a public consultation on the key policy proposals is essential. We look forward to meeting with the Victims and Survivor Consultation Forum this afternoon with the intention of making an Assembly statement tomorrow and opening the public consultation later in the week. This is a major milestone, but there are a number of complex and sensitive issues for us to consider carefully. It's also important that we listen and hear a wide range of views. The consultation will include online and face-to-face -face events to make sure that as many people as possible have the opportunity to contribute during the 12-week period. And this remains one of the most difficult parts um, of our past, and I think we are all personally committed to helping to right the wrongs of the past for these victims and survivors. Linda Dillon for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. And it will come as a great relief to many victims and survivors of mother and baby institutions, Magdalen Laundries and workhouses that this is finally moving forward. Can you give us an assurance that, as has been the case in the past, that victims and survivors will be central to this consultation and that they will be made aware of what is in the statement before it is made to the House? Yeah, I thank the member for asking that question and as I've commented before in this House, I welcome the fact that she and other members have really worked constructively right across the House on, on this issue, given the sensitivities around it. Um, as the Member will know, both the Deputy First Minister and I have been working at pace with our officials around launching this public consultation 
ahead of the summer recess, so I'm really pleased that we're now um, at that stage. But I really want to personally acknowledge, and we'll do so again tomorrow, all those that have campaigned for years to get to this point, and also to acknowledge that the suffering that um, everyone endured um, was traumatic, um, was terrible, and you've waited far too long to get access to truth and accountability. The Deputy First Minister and I look forward to meeting with the Victims and Survivor Consultation Forum this afternoon with, as I said, the intention of making an assembly statement tomorrow and then opening the public consultation later in the week. And it's so important that we hear all the voices, the voices of birth mothers, adopted adults and family members. They are all critical and absolutely central to the process. And we're committed to meeting with the victims and survivors through this process. And I urge them all to engage in it and to make their voices heard. Call Paula Bradshaw. Sorry. Question eight, please. First Minister. With your permission, uh, Junior Minister Riley will take question eight. Thank you. The Executive Office is responsible for taking forward the necessary arrangements to implement the provisions of the Identity and Language Act 2022, including the establishment of the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression, the Irish Language Commissioner, and the Commissioner for the Ulster Scots and the Ulster British Tradition. We have given initial consideration to the appointments process and hope to make an announcement in due course around the necessary recruitment of petitions. Our officials have undertaken the initial work, as I said, um, and that includes the, the practical arrangements to establish these bodies. We have already indicated that the competitions will be run at the same time for up to eight public appointments to these new bodies. Uh, the experience in our department is that public appointment process will take approximately a year from the initial decisions in respect of, the pro when, of, in respect of when the process is made. Call Paula Bradshaw for um, supplementary. Th thank you, and thank you, Junior Minister. Um, we had a presentation in terms of the FICT report recently at the committee, and we were very keen to see how that work um, could be dovetailed into the work of the new office, and we're just wondering what discussions are taking place within the department in that space. Thank you. Senior yeah. Minister. Yeah, listen, it would be no surprise that the member, um, when we're talking about having these offices established, um, along with the commissioners and operating it, it is an absolute priority for me and indeed the department. We want to make sure that the process is done properly and effectively to make sure that the offices are, are of course, that for purpose, but I'm happy to take that back into, into the executive office. Call Malaysia McKee. Well, I got the uh, previous ask and Carla, August uh, Buehis, flesh on the uh, uh, social foster. Uh, Minister, could you outline what steps have been taken to progress the establishment of the three new bodies under the Identity and Language Act? Um, the preparatory work has begun to establish three new bodies under the Identity and Language Act. This place that we call home is so rich and diverse when it comes to language, culture and identity, and we want to make sure that that is reflected and protected by these offices and commissioners. Officials have undertaken preparatory work, including the practical arrangements required to establish the three new bodies under the Language and Identity Act and engagement with different language groups to ensure that the process is properly informed. It is important that this process is done properly and effectively to ensure that these offices are fit for purpose. Ministers have given initial consideration to the appointments process as well, and we hope to make an announcement in due course regarding the recruitment competition. We are determined to, progress, uh, to make progress in this process, and it is a substantial piece of work, but one that we will absolutely deliver on. I call Anya Murphy. Last can call your question name. First Minister. Sorry. I'll ask Junior Minister Riley to answer this question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the, together building a united community, uh, the TBOC strategy reflects the executive's commitment to improving community relations here between people <laughs> from different political, ethnic, and religious backgrounds. Since 2013, a huge amount of progress has been made in key thematic areas such as a shared housing, shared education, removing interface barriers and engaging with young people. The makeup of society is increasingly diverse and we need to make sure that our good relations approach continues to effectively engage with all of those who live here. Officials are, are, are currently developing a final draft to the review for Minister's consideration with the view uh, to developing a refreshed approach to good relations. Um, and what that, will look, what that will look like to build on progress to date. 
Grammy, I've got to pre-ask Ken Coley, and I'd like to thank the Minister for her answer. And I'm happy to hear that the review is underway to build on the, the great work of TBUC. I'm especially pleased as well to note that engaging young people is also a key area of focus. Minister, can you outline what TBUC has delivered for young people uh, during the course of the programme? Kenya Minister. Yeah, absolutely, and I do concur with the member that engaging with young people is, is, is extremely important. important. Um, it's important uh, because young people are part of our community or society, uh, and, and that with the TBOC, which of course stands for, as I mentioned before, uh, together building a united community. And that's recognised that by delivering on the ground and investment, investing in our young people across our communities over the past decade. The planned interventions programme in particular funds community activity to provide positive alternatives for young people at risk of becoming involved in antisocial behaviour, sectarianism and recruitment from paramilitary gangs. And since 2015, through various projects, the programme has been delivered to over 30,000 young people. The outcome of that is that over 90% of those young people have improved self-confidence and are less likely to be involved in negative behaviour. That shows to me the value of investing in our young people, of believing in them, of encouraging them to believe in themselves. And programmes like TBUC provide opportunities for our communities to take positives, positive pathways, to work together, to learn from each other, to build a better place for our people to live, work and thrive. And we as an executive are committed to improving community relations here and looking forward to building on all of the progress we made to date. Call Owen Tennyson for a supplementary. Deputy Speaker, and further to the benefits that the junior minister has just outlined, can I ask what work is currently being underdone in the executive office to protect and insulate good relations funding from cuts in this financial year and the next, given the difficult budgetary position? Junior minister. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm happy to provide that to the member. Which is so we are currently uh, looking at and considering the budget allocations across the executive office, and when that's finalised, we will take a look at and consider the recommendations from officials on how good relations funding should be distributed across TBOC headline actions and broader good relations programmes. Programs. All preparation work is complete, including the assessment process for all 24-25 applications for good relations funding. Letters of offer to successful applicants will be issued where appropriate after a budget for each programme in 24-25 has been confirmed. Uh, call Sinead McLaughlin. First Minister. Again, I'll ask Junior Minister, I need to take this question. Junior Minister. Thank you. Um, through Urban Villages, um, they have provided funding of £92,600 to the Fountain Primary and Nursery School Transport Scheme from September 2017 to March 24. Urban Villages was never intended to be a core funder, and the idea and aim was to provide additionality to existing provision within areas. Revenue funding for all Urban Villages community-led and cross-cutting projects ceased on 31 March 2024, and funding for the, the, the Fountain School Transport Scheme was part of this funding. Officials have put together a range of options for the future of the Urban Villages programme, we are committed to continuing to promote thriving places and achieve the best outcomes for all of our citizens. And we will, of course, update members on future plans for the programme once options have been considered. Sinead McLaughlin for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Junior Minister. Have you considered and responded to the request from the Education Minister for you to reverse this decision um, to remove funding from this school transport? And if so, what rationale have you used? Junior Minister. Well, as I said before, the Urban Villages has provided funding of 90, 92 mm -hmm. to the Fountain Primary and Nursery School Transport Scheme from 2017 to March 24. And I am aware that uh, the Minister of Education has also visited the school recently. I've been in Derry on a number of occasions, along with Junior Minister Cameron. We've visited the Greater Chantelow Community Arts, Newgate Arts and, and Culture Centre, Foyles, Foyles Women's Aid. And we've been able to see firsthand the great work and in particular the community and voluntary sector and the vision that they have for their communities. I want and will work alongside anyone and everyone because we see and recognise the importance of, posit of positivity that urban villages brings to Derry. We have seen other positive outworkings throughout Derry, whether that be the McGee, Camp McGee campus expansion, the redevelopment of Meenan Square, the investment in Ebrington. And our department and other departments will continue with that positive work and ensuring the delivery of the people of Derry. 
Over one million people have benefited from the Urban Villages programme in Derry, which has helped boost and support community work, tourism and heritage pro projects. The Urban Villages team will be operating in Derry, South Norea, Bishop Street and Bogside until at least 2027 to allow the planned capital projects to complete. And we will continue to work with our colleagues and other departments as well to find out how we can best support and deliver communities in a way which is impactful and sustainable. Call Patrick Delargy. Thank you, um, the Minister will be acutely aware of the investment that is already going on um, to the Fountain Bishop Street and right across my own area, across the Mirror. Um, can she provide any more update as to some of the specific programmes and achievements to date? Well, yes, as I mentioned before, over one million people have benefited from the 2.4 million investment in the dairy through the Urban Villages programme. And that, ha that has helped boost and support community work, tourism and heritage projects, education, arts and culture by investing not only in capital projects, but in the capacity required to ensure sustainability and long-term positive social and economic impacts on the city. The Executive Office will continue to speak to those delivery partners on the ground to ensure their input is considered as we move forward and to determine the best way to build upon all that has been achieved so far. Collaboration with our Executive colleagues will be key to this work, and I look forward to updating members on future plans for the programme once options have been considered. Um, Ms McElveen is in her place. I call on Roberts, Robinson sorry, very quickly. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker. You have literally a half a minute. <laughs> we are determined to build a safer society free from the negative influences of paramilitarism, criminality and coercive control. We are doing this through a number of initiatives working to protect children and young people from exploitation by paramilitary and criminal gangs. This includes projects such as the Planned Interventions Programme funded through TBOOC. This scheme provides positive alternatives for our young people at risk of becoming involved in antisocial behaviour, sectarianism and recruitment from paramilitary gangs. In addition to the Communities in Transition Project, which is part of the Tackling Paramilitary Activity, Criminality and Organised Crime Programme, um, delivers projects which raise the aspirations of young people. It aims to create better life choices for young people and also delivers interventions focused on combating child criminal and child sexual exploitation. Our delivery partners and officials are working closely with the statutory agencies with the responsibility for these matters. I'm sorry, all time's up. Okay, so that ends the period for list of questions. We'll now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions and I call Matthew O'Toole. Uh, First Minister, I can be robust in opposition, but I sincerely respect the fact that you and the Deputy First Minister are trying hard to put the best foot forward in terms of this region uh, to encourage investment and a positive perception of this place. Unfortunately, in the northern part of Belfast City Centre, an area commonly known now as the Tribeca Project, years of progressive deterioration are, compromi are, compromising, are compromising the perception of this city and this region. What do you think should be done about it? Well, I think we should all be passionate about trying to lift up all of our city centres, all of our communities, all our high streets. Um, we've done some work on that in the executive in the past. Um, I think it's important that we uh, send out a very positive message that Belfast is very much open for business, that we send out a very positive message that we have some fantastic innovative businesses in our city centre, and that, yes, there are, there are issues that need to be resolved, and I note the recent appointment of the Night Times Hour, which I think is a great addition. Also, you'll know that the responsibility for regenerating the, town, the city centre comes um, directly from the remit of the council. And our department, and I'm sure every other department actually around the executive, would be more than happy to continue to work um, to promote that positive uh, message for Belfast city centre regeneration, including the housing projects, including um, town centre re revitalisation. Um, in creating that um, economy where we had the nighttime economy, where we had the daytime economy, where we have homes built, um, and we even accommodate our students now with the, the huge number of students. So I think there's huge potential there, and we should focus on building up on those positives and dealing with the challenges. Matthew, supplementary. Um, Minister, I, I appreciate those general answers, but I was asking specifically about Tribeca. North Street is a disaster, and uh, both of our parties, including I think yourself, have, have met with the developers. If Belfast City Council and others cannot progress this project, including up to and including the acquisition vesting of all or part of that site, would you be willing to step in and, on behalf of the executive, take the steps necessary, including potentially use of financial transactions capital 
to acquire all or part of that site so that we can overcome the specific dereliction in that part of the city, which is really letting us all down. First Minister. Well, let's just continue to um, work together to try to resolve any issues that are there. I'm, I'm not going to make policy up on, the hoof, on behalf of the Executive, but I will certainly um, continue to pledge my support to work with Belfast City Council to find the solutions that allows us to make Belfast the most vibrant city that it can be, that we attract visitors as we do in great numbers, and um, that we work with the, the retail sector, that we work with the hospitality sector, that we work um, with the tourism sector, that we work right across the board to make it the best place that it can be, and I will not be found wanting in that regard. Paul Morris Bradley. Is she aware that this year's Super Cup NA takes place between the 21st and the 26th of July? Would the First Minister agree with me that this is a great opportunity for young people to compete with the best across the world and also to showcase the North Coast and Northern Ireland in its entirety? Minister. Yes, I absolutely concur with the member, and I know that the House was um, earlier debating um, opportunities for our young people. This is a great example of an opportunity for our young people in terms of the sporting field and to compete with people from you know right across and the international community. I think is a real positive um, experience for so many people. Um, I'm hoping to actually have a chance to be there and be some some part of it at some stage um, whenever it comes here. But couldn't concur with you enough in terms of what it means. Again, this is about um, that investment in the, in the North West. It's about all the visitors that it brings. It's about the, the legacy of sport again. And it's about investing in our young people. So absolutely positive. Morris Bradley for supplementary. Thank you for your answer, First Minister. But could you uh, commit the Executive Office to working closely with the organisers of the event, uh, this competition, to promote it annually going forward? First Minister. Yes, I'll certainly um, take that back to, to our office uh, and we can discuss just how exactly the, the cup is supported and if there are other areas that we need to look at, then I'm happy to do that. Well, John Bunty. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, the media is reporting about the potential sale of Spirit Aero Systems. Um, does the First Minister agree with Group Chairman Sir Michael uh, Ryan, who has said that any dismantling of the business would be extremely detrimental to the long-term future of Belfast business and, by extension, the region's aerospace industry. And what is her assessment of the potential impact? First Minister. Yeah, I know this is very current in the media and obviously a major employer, so we need to work with the industry themselves, work with the, the business themselves to see what is within our remit in terms of, of supporting. This is a big employer. In East Belfast, I, I respect that. So um, we haven't had any uh, direct correspondence to ourselves yet, but I'm sure that will come, just given that it's a, a breaking story. Joanne Bundy for supplementary. Thank, Thank the First Minister for that. But will she, um, the Deputy First Minister and the Economy Minister, undertake um, to take action um, and maybe outline for us the action she will take to secure the integrity of this business? First Minister. Yes, I'm very happy to talk to our Economy Minister around any engagement that he perhaps already has had. Um, I myself have engaged with Bombardier in the past, obviously now um, Spirit, but um, this is, as I said, a major employer, so let's see what, what we can do to support them. Cheryl Brownlee. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the First Minister for her answers so far. 75% um, of the democratic world is heading to the polls this year. The world is changing, and so are policy. So does the Executive Office, um, in terms of their strategy, how have they integrated this into their international relationships, international relations strategy? First Minister. Yes, I, uh, you're right. Two-thirds of the world is going to the polls. That is some change in, in, one, in one year. So um, who knows where we'll be at by the end of this year in terms of changes that are afoot. But I think all that has to reflect just even ourselves, our own international relations strategy, where we're at, where we're targeting. Um, obviously, in a post-Brexit world as well, um, access to the, both the British and the EU market. What, what markets does that open up for us in terms of um, um, manufacturing, for example? Um, so I think that we have to reflect that in our own international relations strategy, and that will be um, embedded into a, a new programme that we bring forward um, and perhaps we'll probably be making a statement to the Assembly at some point in the future around that. Cheryl Burnley for supplementary. Thank you for your answer um, for that. In terms of a time frame of implementation, do you have any idea of when this announcement would be happening? Mr Minister. 
Um, well, obviously now we've only got one more week left of the assembly, so I think it'll be September time before we're able to bring that forward. But um, it's a piece of work that's been ongoing for some time, and I think that we probably would be um, very early in, in the new political season, if you want to call it that, um, from September, able to bring it back at that time. Paul Chamel Holland. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much, First Minister. Um, given that we go to the polls next week or the week after, um, would the uh, First Minister give me an assessment of votes at 16 and where she thinks that would make a difference in Northern Ireland and in our politics here? First Minister. It's not strictly under the remit of our department, however, I will give you my view of votes at 16. I believe that that should be expanded to young people. I think that our young people are well in tune to what they need and what they want. Isn't that what politics is about? It's about voting for change. It's about getting the opportunity to have your say on something. So I would absolutely concur that that's something that I would like to see extended. I know on a party political basis, that's something that I would campaign for and regularly engage um, with the electoral office and the powers that be in terms of um, electoral law. Sean Mulholland for supplementary. Yeah, and that was with, in, with indulgence. I know it's obviously the Northern Ireland office, but would the minister, uh, First Minister, commit to writing to whoever the new Secretary of State is post 5th of July um, to ask for the powers to bring in votes 16 here be devolved to this House rather than it be, um, still being sitting with the, the NIO? First Minister. Well, that, that's certainly my personal view uh, in terms of what I think should happen um, and um, we can discuss it again at our Executive Office but it's certainly my personal view that's something that we should have. We should have control of the maximum number of powers that impact on our lives here and the people we represent. So I would concur with that. And just over the course of, just when you're speaking about young people and 16-year-olds, um, over the course of the last two weeks, I think every member in this chamber has brought young people in here for work experience. And I think that's a fantastic thing and something that we all should encourage because we want young people to be part of the electoral system and the democratic system. We want our politics to reflect society. We want our politics to have more young people, more people from black and ethnic minority backgrounds. We want our politics to reflect the world that we live in. So my message, and I'm sure you will concur, to all young people out there is that there's a role for you to play in politics. And um, voting, obviously, is, is, a, is a key element to that. And I, like you, share the view that, that voting aid should be lowered. Called Steve Bacon. And may I thank the First Minister for her answers so far? Uh, first Minister, or indeed uh, First and Deputy First Ministers, there's £370 million available, supposedly, in the June monitoring round. When are the, is the June monitoring round going to be released, and when is it going to be tabled on the Executive? First Minister. Um, can I say that um, we know that our Finance Minister has um, indicated that she is ready to make allocations? So. <laughs> Um, I would like to see the executive meeting uh, sooner rather than later so that we can get that money allocated. Um, I don't know where you get your specific figure from, but um, that's, for, that's for yourself to, to refer to. But certainly there is money to be allocated in June monitoring, and I want to get that done as quickly as possible because it gives that certainty for our departments um, that are struggling with the budget that they currently have. So there is additionality there to come, um, and I hope that that's um, in the coming days. Steve Aiken for supplementary. Yeah. And I, I sort of, for a declaration of interest, of course, I sit in the Finance Committee, so I'm fully aware of what's available in Ardell and sort of capital that's due to come through. Uh, Minister, time is running out for the allocation of these funds for our vital public services. What is the, your office, or combined offices, going to do to expedite this process? Because, as you've already said, we've only got a week left of this assembly before we break for the summer. First Minister. Yes, as I said, the Finance Minister has uh, written to say that she is ready to make the allocations. I want that meeting to happen, and I hope that we get agreement for that meeting to happen. And I don't think that we need to wait to the other side of the election for that to happen, because I believe this is business continuity, this is business as usual, but that's my, my view of it. Um, I will still try to get an executive meeting tabled and scheduled sorry, so that we can have this discussion. I'll call David Honey for it. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, in light of the recent economic data that have been released, can you first Mr. outline the Executive Office's role in setting economic policy? So, in terms of the economic strategy, um, it's the Economy Minister who sets out the vision and has done so since he's come into office, um, based around sort of four key things. Um, uh, one being um, more jobs, better jobs, better paid jobs, so productivity is a huge um, area. The green economy, because there's clear, huge potential there. Um, regional balance, because we need to make sure that everybody shares in the prosperity agenda. I think that's really, really uh, important. So 
Um, he takes the lead in terms of that, but then obviously to complement that work, both myself and the Deputy First Minister in terms of international relations strategy, in terms of our engagements uh, in a dip diplomatic way, then that all complements and overlays the work that's done within the Department of the Economy. David Honeyford for supplementary. Thank you, and thank, thank you for the, uh, your answer. Um, can, can you set out the work then that the Economic Policy Division, that's part of, of your department, has carried out since restoration? Yeah, again, this is about um, really liaising with Invest NA, um, liaising with the Department of the Economy. In terms of the actual remit of the policy area, I'm very happy to extend that to you in writing. Um, I don't have that in front of me, but it's certainly around those areas that I've just talked about and um, working with the other key players, key stakeholders, if you like, whether that be Invest NA or the Department of the Economy officials. Um, that linkage is very strong, but I'll, I'll, I'll write to the member. Paul Allen Chambers. So, what's bigger? Uh, could I ask the First Minister and Deputy First Minister for, for an update on the number of applications received to date um, and the number of applicants that have actually received an award from the Troubles Permanent Disability Payment Scheme? First Minister. Just trying to find the figures um, for the member. Um, two seconds. So, perhaps I'll write. Oh no, hold on, I have it. I have it. Um, so the victim, the VSS bereave scheme reopened to new clients in April 2021, and previously only victims who had registered before 20 or 31st of March were eligible. VSS direct uh, self-directed support schemes provided over 13.5 million of funding to date to support bereaved um, victims and survivors. Um, in terms of the victim's payment, over 45 million has been paid um, since the scheme um, opened. And in terms of the actual number of individuals, that's the part I will write to you on. Yeah. On Chambers for supplementary. Minister, what, can you tell me what is the average time scale from application to decision? Thank you. First Minister. Um, I don't have the average time frame in front of me, but I can say to you that there are concerns about the length of time that it can take to process um, the application. However, I know that each application is unique and can be quite complex in terms of um, the assessment and the historic nature of much of the evidence. But we are keeping that under constant review for looking for ways to continually improve the throughput of cases and actually engaging closely with the victims and their representative groups who are um, bringing these issues um, to us so that we can continue to make things an improved situation for victims coming forward. Oh, he's already asked. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, listen, that's time's up. We're now going to move on to questions for the Minister for the Economy. And we'll start with a list of questions. And I call Sarah Eastwood. Oh, hold on. Sorry, we're waiting on the Economy Minister. Just take your easy minute.